I'd like to welcome your brothers and sisters for, to the services for Brother Larry Frost. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to meet together to celebrate his life. The family prayer was offered by Brother James McMahon. Uh, our prelude music was offered by Sister Shepatello. Um, my name is Bishop Lewis. I'll be presiding and conducting today. Our chorister this morning is Brother Larry Frost, and our pianist is Elaine Frost. We are going to open the meeting by seeing him number 85, How Firm a Foundation, after which our opening prayer will be offered by Susie McMahon. <laughs> Father, as we come before you this morning to celebrate the life of our father, Larry Frost, we ask you to be with us that we will be able to do the things that we know that Daddy would want us to do. Be with the speakers that they'll be able to get their message across to us. We're thankful for the life that Daddy has had, for the the way he has taught us in the gospel. We're thankful for the gospel in our lives. and We pray for all those that are here today. We're thankful for all the many blessings that we, we enjoy, and we humbly say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, we're going to begin by having a history by Karen Warner, and we will have Memories by Diana Reed. Following that, we're going to have a special musical number, Love at Home, and that is, uh, will be offered by the Conrad Frost family. Following that, we'll have a talk by Brother Conrad Frost. We'll go to that point.
bear with me. To experience a history of Larry's life is to hear a record of the 20th century. He was born in Snowflake, Arizona on August 7, 1917. He lived through 12 decades. His parents, Erastus, Stam, Frost, and Ada Frost were overjoyed to greet him into their lives. At the time of his birth, the world was in a process of closing down World War II, War I. But soon the Spanish flu enveloped the world. In the small town of Snowflake, there was quarantine and masks recommended for all. It caused many deaths in the small town, but Larry and his parents were blessed by avoiding this terrible epidemic. His family, his father began building a home for his growing family. There were now three sisters, Carmel, Rose, and baby Corrine, brother Jay. The house was only three small rooms with a porch where the boys slept. The house stood along the railroad tracks, and running parallel to the tracks was a power line, sorry, giving Snowflake the electricity needed to keep up with the rest of America. Because his father was a handyman, he had been hired to make the critical changes to the equipment on the poles. On August 6, 1927, Larry and his little brother stood at the foot of a light pole which was the closest to their home. The little boys visited with their fathers who was busily replacing parts. Mama Ada watched through the window while her little family, while her little boys were talking to their father. When the lights came on, Ada knew that he had not completed his task. As the three of them watched, Stem was electrocuted. This was a devastating blow to the family. The young widow now had five children left to raise alone. The widowed mother never received compensation for the accident that took the life of her husband. In the meantime, America was party with great exuberance during the gay 20s. The Spanish flu had killed over 5 million people in America, and survivors needed fun and entertainment. 1930s. Larry was now the man of the family, and he took his part to heart. At the age of 12, he was digging ditches, and because he was such a good worker, he was promoted from a child's wage to a man's. He continued this habit of hard work his entire life. Now Larry was making approximately 50 cents a day, but Larry and all others during the Depression learned to make with, do with whatever was available. They fixed vehicles, built, built, rebuilt buildings, etc. It was also necessary to raise a garden to survive. Animals were also very much needed. Several times, Larry worked diligently, but received no compensation except food or hay to feed his little burro and their milk cow. When Larry began high school, he loved math, but wasn't so fond of history. He often said later that he re regretted not learning more about history. His schooling was often interrupted by jobs that he took to support his mom and siblings. During the Depression, Jobs were very difficult to find. There was no job that he felt was beneath him. He drove trucks, graders, hauled hay, worked cattle with his flake relatives, and broke horses. Along with the Dust Bowl in the Midwest, it was a long 10 years before things began to be normal. 1940. When the 1940s arrived, the world was under great tension from the Nazi threat. Because it was so difficult to find jobs, many young men joined the military. Younger brother Jay joined when he was only 16. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, the small town of Snowflake received the news while in church. America now became embroiled in World War II. Since Larry was his mother's only support, and because he was now driving a truck for a transportation company covering good, delivering goods to the southern part of Navajo County, he was deferred from the draft. 
He was also driving. He was all, sorry. He was also driving the bus between McNary and Sholo. He had moved to Sholo because jobs were more plentiful there, but he would go back on, the, on Sunday to visit his mother and then return to Sholo to work. While driving the bus, he caught sight of a very pretty, vivacious young woman named Hilda Lewis. He was in shock when she agreed to date him, as his dating career had been few to none. They enjoyed each other very much, taking long hours sharing experiences. She taught him to dance. All the young folks who remained at home banded together and held parties or went to dances. People all over the world were rushing to marry before the men were called away to war. And so Hilda and Larry were married on June 30th, 1943. He also acquired a tango, three-year-old. I'm so sorry. Nancy Karen Warner, Ralston, sorry. The three of us moved into a small house close by his work at Smith Haywood. But soon Daddy's patriotic feelings caught up to him, and he joined the Navy, entering the Seabees, which was the transportation department of the Navy. So away he went to England. His base was bombed occasionally, but their job was to supply the equipment to the Army to help win the war. While there, he made lifelong friends with men who were on his team. And a great honor was given by England by providing the great ship Queen Mary to bring the American soldiers home. 1950s. When this greatest generation returned home, the joy and hope was almost unbearable. These men and women set to work to make America become the dream they had envisioned while pining for home from faraway places. And under the frightening new fear of nuclear weapons that had been unleashed upon the world, undeterred, they entered the 1950s, bringing a peaceful, wonderful time. They could spoil their children, helping them attend college or buy vehicles, giving them things that they were never able to enjoy in their youth. Teenagers was a new word that was coined in the dictionary. Rock and roll, Elvis, Pat Boone, took the place of the music the soldier had listened to when they fell in love. Larry now purchased a, a piece of land from Hilda's father, and together they built a home. He did it virtually alone, even sawing the logs by hand, laying concrete floors. They never had a mortgage, borrowing $500, buying supplies, using them up, then borrowing more money to continue until the house was completed. It was small to begin with, one small room for the bedrooms and a larger space for kitchen and living room. No bathroom yet, however, the toilet sat on a concrete clap, slab against the back of the house with cardboard walls to protect privacy from everyone but the family dog who loved to stick his nose through the cracks. <laughs> Larry soon added more rooms to accommodate the growing family. He also added more land alongside the family home to build his mother a home. However, sadly, she died before able to live in it. A wood-burning stove added great comfort to the family's home. And it also became a necessity for wood to burn in the stove. And so a great bonding of the family began by cutting wood, gathering it, and bringing it home to burn in the comfort of that wood. Anybody who ever experienced that stove knows what I mean. It was glorious. 
Larry and Hilda's family net were comprised of Karen, Diana, Susan, Eric, Alana, Kirk, and Conrad. In the late 50s, they added two Apache boys, Victor and Nat Velasquez. Larry loved his family and worked long and hard hours to provide for them. He was working for Smith Haywood Lines, driving the only ambulance in town, was a volunteer firefighter. Sorry, he began working at Arizona Department of Transportation, but still continued to take runs at night for Smith Haywood Lines. Driving to Globe, he would sleep until the truck from Phoenix came to meet, and then they traded trucks and both returned back to home so that they could catch a couple of hours before the new day began. The family could all hear in the quiet of the night as his tires crossed the cattle guard as he came across, on, was driving on the street. We could then turn over and go back to sleep knowing he was safe. 1960s and 70s. Then came the Vietnam War with the great disruption dividing the nation. Those teenagers had grown now experiencing drug use and rebellion against all their parents had strived for. Victor went to war as a Marine, wounded four times before returning home to stress and hatred. The soldiers who fought were at contracepts with those who had not fought. Diana's husband, James Fergus, also served in Vietnam. All the while, Larry was serving his community and church he had been in the bishopric in the 50s, as well as many other church jobs wherever he was needed. He helped build the LDS church that we are now sitting in. His friends from World War II remained close to his heart, as well as the friends and neighbors he had known all his life. He remained lifelong friends until he was the last man standing from his cohorts. He was the longest living of both his mother and father's family, and also the in-laws, Lewis and Whipples. 1980s. Larry decided to retire from the state job when he was 62, thinking he only had about five years left to live. <laughs> but then the job that truly fulfilled him, he got to work at the church ranch with the cattle that was owned by the church. He was in his element. Several of his grandchildren also got to experience a real cowboy life, mending fences, herding, branding, and driving the cattle, and oh, the campfire cooking. The family suffered a great loss of their son and brother when he was murdered. When Kirk died, he left his home in Tempe to Larry and Hilda, mom and daddy, it opened up a whole new world of wonderful experiences for them. They were able to live in Sydney, Australia, serving an LDS mission. They both enjoyed it so much, so much to explore and see for these country hips. 1990s. After returning home to America, they began working at the Mesa Temple, driving back and forth from Sholo to Tempe every week. It became increasingly difficult for them, and they made a very hard decision to sell the home that he had built. After a couple of sales exchanges, it became the house. It is just half, it is just half a block away. You can see the bones of the original house. When Larry was given a grand tour of the house, he was so happy with what these young couples had done with it. He called it a masterpiece. 2000, 2010s, when Mama died in 2016, he wanted to stay in the house in Tempe as most of his friends from Sholo had moved to the valley and he had numerous new friends in Tempe. He was called Grandpa Frost and people were amazed at the stamina he showed. He walked for miles during the 90s and early 2000s as the freeway was built close by his home. He enjoyed watching the large equipment working. 
He and his doggy companion walked around the block every morning until just three weeks before he passed. Daddy was also an animal and baby magnet. He loved to watch the children, to tease them and watch their antics. He would come home from church and report to me all the cute things that they had done. His grandkids, great-grands, and great-great-grands had been play, loved to play and visit, playing with the toys that had been played with when Mama had her kindergarten back in the 60s and 70s. His children were married and were having children. His family is growing by leaps and bounds and still is. Daddy was the epitome of the common man during his lifetime. He was honest, humble, did not seek or want attention for his accomplishments, giving generously of his time and money, hardworking, respectful, loving, faithful, patriotic, religious, teaching his children to be hard workers, to not be too proud to take a menial job. He was not born of royal lineage, but over time, he gained the status of uncommon man. And now, in these difficult and uncertain times, hopefully those of us who remain can meet the tests and trials that will be ours, just as he met the numerous challenges of his lifetime. Thank you, Daddy, for the heritage you left for all of us to emulate. We have been honored to have you in our lives. I am using memories of family members to share who Larry Frost was. Daddy was honest. Daddy and Eric were out west of town when Eric was only about four or five. Daddy pointed out where the cattlemen had put some salt blocks for the cows and told him that even though we could use a block for our milk cow, we would not take one. That lesson on honesty stuck with him throughout his life. Daddy prided himself on being honest. Eric went with witnessed him give a man $20,000 when he was not legally obligated just to be able to retain his honesty. He admitted many years later that he should have followed my Eric's advice and not paid the money. Karen was traveling with Daddy and as they crossed the Arizona-California border back in the days when fruit was not allowed to cross the border because of bugs and infectious diseases that would be spread to the fruit trees, they had a pretty good sized bag of oranges that they had bought to snack on. As the border patrol approached the car, his speech primed to ask if, we ha if they had anything that they were not supposed to have. Daddy reached and got the bag of oranges, handed, handed them over to the border patrol, who took them and nodded them on to the border. After pulling out of the station, they saw a sign that said, Fruit was now able to cross into California. If Daddy had been dishonest and hid the oranges, we could have kept them. But Daddy did what he believed was the honest thing to do. Daddy loved to take his children on deliveries. As children, Daddy would take us with him as he made deliveries or pickups for his job. One of my favorite times was when we would go to Vernon to pick up a load of lumber. While he was loading, I would go over between the stacks of lumber where it was cool and damp. Once, Alana was riding in a pickup when the door flew open and she was holding on for dear life. One trip I made with him on the Smith Haywood truck, we stopped in Miami to get a quart of chocolate milk and drove just out of town to a pull-off. When we got there, when we got out, there was an unopened package of sweet rolls laying on the ground, which was warm from the sun. They made a great breakfast. 
Special Moments with Daddy. When Timothy and Rusty were four years old, they attended their grandma's kindergarten. One day, they skipped kindergarten and decided to go to Rusty's house to play. On their way, they passed their Aunt Marbury working in her garden. They waved and said hello. Aunt Marbury went up to her house and called Mom and Daddy to see if they knew where two little boys were. Grandpa collected them and gave them a stern lecture. Grandma took some, Grandpa took some of the kids to the barn to learn to, or to help milk cows and let them try pulling on the tit. Timothy said he wasn't very good at it. Later, they learned how to make butter in the kitchen with Grandma. Grandpa would grow corn cane in his garden. He would take the kids out and he, could he would use his pocket knife to cut the stalk off and peel it down to the sweet part. They would suck on the stick all day long. Alan was visiting Mom and Daddy when, when he decided he needed a new wallet. Daddy decided it was time for him to get one, so he purchased two wallets, exactly alike, which was special to know for Alan to know that his grandpa had a wallet just like his. Alan recalled his grandpa going through his wallet and had a $50 bill. He said it was for emergencies and not to tell grandma. He said he, said he used to have a $100 bill, but needed to use it. Daddy was in the hospital when Susan's first baby was born. A couple of years later, when she was expecting twins, he was parking the car when the first twin was born and got back inside just in time for the second twin to be born. One day, he needed me to help him start his pickup. I was in the ambulance and slowly pulled forward until I felt the chain tug. So I put my foot down to the gas and took off. I looked behind me when I got to the bridge, and there was no pickup behind me. Daddy was doing a war dance beside the pickup, and I was pulling the detached bumper. So I proceeded around the block because I was not going back there. Daddy was not out front when I got back. One trip I made with him on the Smith Haywood truck, we stopped, whoops, I already did that one. Another trip, the two of us were going to California to visit Karen. When we got to the valley, the roads were flooded. We went down baseline as we thought the flood wouldn't be as high over there. The water was just below the fence posts along the road. We met a policeman coming towards us and expected him to turn us around. He asked us how we were and he continued. When we got out of town a ways, we went through a cutout in a hill. As we entered, the ditch on the side of the road was overflowing, but when we got to the other side, the ditch was dry, but looking back, you could see the water coming. On the Grand Canyon hike with the Shoal Ward young men, Eric tried to be one of the first boys to get to the campground. After arriving, he re realized that Daddy was not there and that he would be the last one coming in since he would be ensuring the laggards would make it safely. They had started down in the canyon about 1 p.m. and didn't get into the campground until after dark, probably 8 or 9 p.m. The hike was in April, so the night was freezing cold to us within bedrolls. To keep warm, Daddy and he tried to fit into one bedroll so they could share body heat. Rhonda remembers going with him after Melissa the cow died to bottle feed her baby calf. Gina appreci appreciated Grandpa's strength and support, from driving her siblings to meet their dad on weekends to playing toys with her kids on the living, floor, living room floor. One time they were having liver and onions and Gina was told to finish her plate. Grandpa saw that she was struggling so he switched plates with her and when he, her dad was not looking. <laughs> Everything he did, he always did it with a smile and a quiet chuckle. But Gina's absolute favorite memory was coming around the corner while attending the temple, only to see sweet grandpa while he was working in the temple. Oh, what a sweet hug they shared. 
Grandpa always brought Susie's kids a seven up whenever they were homesick from school and would visit with them to make sure that they were okay. Laura's last, lasting memory of Grandpa is when she was around five or six years old. She was playing on the stairs in their house, starting at the top and sliding down bump, bump, bump on her rump, then scrambling back up the steps to get to the top to start over again. She remembers Grandpa yelling at her to stop, but she decided that she didn't want to stop, and what she was doing was too much fun to stop. So she bump, bump, bumped herself down the stairs again one more time. As she turned around to scurry back to the top, she was met with a very shocking whop on her bum. Grandpa had spanked her so hard her teeth rattled. She cut a high path around him for quite a while after that, and the next time he told her to do something, she did it. He meant what he said. When Grandpa was 102, Laura's son, Zane, was being inducted into the Air Force as a second lieutenant, and he asked Grandpa if he would come to the ceremony and give him his first salute. Being on that stage with her son while Grandpa gave Zane his first salute was one of the most endearing, powerful moments of Laura's life. The crowd was on their feet cheering, and the applause was roaring when they introduced Grandpa, a 102-year-old World War II veteran, it's a memory that her son and her entire family will never forget. It meant the world to Zane to have Grandpa there with him at that very special moment in their life. <coughs> Daddy loved a good joke, or trick, or whatever you want to call it. Daddy loved to pull jokes on people. One day, as he was working on his car, Aunt Marjorie came to visit. While she was visiting, he jacked up her car far enough that the wheels couldn't make contact with the ground. Of course, when she came out and tried to, to leave, something was wrong with her car and asked for help. Daddy was enjoying his trick and she would have bopped him if she could, probably catch him, but he had to help her go home. While in Salt Lake City for general conference, he went to a store that sold cut glass glasses that had a slit here and there around the rim that as one drank, the liquid would drip out. Our guests were always given that glass. <laughs> he also bought a pen that you could put a cap in which when you pull the lid off, there would be a loud bang. When someone had asked for a pen, he would give it to them. He forgot he had it in his at a church one day, and someone borrowed it. <laughs> Over the, the last 10 years, Laura had the pleasure to get to know Grandpa's silly side. He always had a funny comeback, like when she would call him and say, Hi, Gramps. How are you doing today? Still kicking? He'd say, Not very high. The last time Laura saw him, she kissed his head and said, I love you, Grandpa. I'll be back in a couple of days. Don't go anywhere, Grandpa whispered. I'll check my schedule. <laughs> Daddy loved to work. Daddy began working early in his life as his father was killed the day before he was 10 years old. He would spend summers working for uncles who promised a side of beef for a winter's hay as wages. The blacksmith in town started picking him up before school to have him help him and one of the jobs was rolling the metal tire frame down to the irrigation to cool it. He would then feed Daddy breakfast before sending him to school. Out of high school, he was one of the workers on the Lone Pine Dam, as he learned to drive the earth-moving machinery. He began working for Smith Haywood as a delivery man or truck driver. Over the years, he took a mechanics correspondence course and practiced fixing the trucks he was driving on or driving. When he worked at the Arizona State Highway Department, he was a heavy-duty mechanic. He was often asked to help with the problem at one of the other shops, which had him driving to St. John's or other towns on the mountain. He knew the workings of an engine, not just how to tighten a bolt here or there, but would, would could, 
he could figure out what the problem was within the engine. And fall was for wood cutting. He would go out on Friday night, cut down a tree, and start cutting it up, and then return the next day to retrieve the wood. Sometimes he would bring a load in Friday night and return the next day to get one or two more loads. As his children grew, he would get a load, which one of them would take it in, then someone else would bring the pickup and trailer back in the, ne the next morning. Kids and grandkids alike learned to love going after wood with Daddy. In the year 2000, Laura's family was moving to Pittsburgh. And at the tail end of the move, when things were getting ugly, guess who showed up to help? Grandpa and Grandma. Grandpa, Grandma went to work sweeping and vacuuming, and Grandpa helped load the truck with the last few items. One of the last things to go was a very large potted cactus. We were looking for the dolly when Grandpa bent down, lifted the thing up, and carted it off to the truck, like it was nothing. I followed it down the sidewalk saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you should be doing that. But he was a tank and the strongest 80-year-old man I had ever laid eyes on. Another favorite memory was when Grandpa was 96. Laura wanted to do a little sprucing up in her backyard, and she thought it might be something Grandpa would enjoy her helping her with. So off to the office depot they went. After they had everything she need, that she needed, Grandpa remembered he needed a couple of bags of concrete. Just then, a nice young man asked if we needed any help, and, they, and she told them they needed some bags of concrete. He walked them over to the spot where the concrete was, and as the young man was about to walk around the cart to help, Grandpa went, bent down and deadlifted two bags of concrete onto the flatbed cart. That kid almost fell over. He said, sir, do you need help? Grandpa said, well, I probably need a lot of help, but not with this. <laughs> Daddy loved challenges. His life was full of challenges, so he learned to figure out how to meet them head on. When he first started driving truck to the valley, Salt River Canyon was just a two-lane dirt road. There was one curve that he would have to seesaw the truck and trailer to make, to go past it. Daddy built our home without having a construction background or electric saws. Each board he sawed, he did it with a hand saw. He worked early before going to work and then would work on it after finish his daily work and before he left for the night run. He drove to Globe to meet the truck coming from Phoenix. When he would return, we could hear the truck as it went over the cattle guard at the reservation line. Then we could hear him gear down to turn the corner off Main Street. And within five minutes, we could hear him come in the front door. Brian tells of his grandpa replacing his own air conditioner. He would have been in his, in his 80s at this point, too, and he got up on the roof to remove the HVAC unit. He tied a rope around the air conditioner and lowered it off the roof. And Brian was pretty sure that he muscled the new HVAC unit back up on top of the roof. A challenge that Brian heard about was the time one of my aunts, one of his aunts, parked behind Grandpa's car and left with Grandma and another aunt to go shopping. When Grandpa got ready to leave, he was blocked in. Rather than wait, Grandpa jacked up the front of the car, pushed the car off the jack, moving the front sideways a couple of inches. He repeated the same on the back and the front, over and over, until the car was no longer blocking him in. How do you stop Grandpa when he has some place to be? <laughs> Another memory is about 20 years ago, Grandpa and Grandma visited Brian and Maria in Chula Vista. They had a house with a security fence that was about six foot tall. Grandpa and Grandma arrived after dark. They visited and went to bed. Over breakfast, breakfast the next morning, Grandpa asked about a strip mall that he saw over by the high school. Brian was confused because that little strip mall would not have been on the way from the freeway to their house. He asked Grandpa how he knew about it. He said he got up in the morning and went for a walk. Grandpa would have been about 84 or 85 years old 
and would have had to climb the six foot tall security fence on his way out and climb it when he came back. <laughs> Daddy loved to tell stories or experiences. Each of the children and grandchildren tell of listening to Daddy's many stories, which were very detailed. His stories covered his childhood, his mechanic experience, and vehicles he had repaired and trips he had been on. Daddy's memories of his life were very strong. You could tell, he could tell you the type of truck, the motor, any special problems he had with it. And as he worked for the Arizona State Highway Department, he told many stories of having to rescue workers whose snow plows or trucks were stuck or broken, and as the mechanic, he had to go fix them in the snow. Ian recalls when his family would visit, the kids would be on the floor and couches with Grandpa in his chair. Often they would keep him talking into the early morning hours. He loved the way Grandpa could paint a picture of the workings of a motor as he described every detail. Brian remembers that Grandpa always had a smile on his face when he'd tell you a story about when he was younger. One episode from his state highway days, he had to go to the top of Green, Green's Peak in a storm, snowstorm. As he drove along, he saw a pair of tracks, which seemed unusual, but he continued on until he discovered two sets of tracks and realized he was going in a circle. <laughs> Emma tells of a choice experience during Daddy's first, first visit to Idaho. I was sitting in the warm spring sun and listening to Grandpa and his stories. The most poignant ones were about him and his family after his di dad had died, since it was something she could relate to in a very personal way. Daddy had no hobbies. Daddy was interviewed in the last few years, and when asked what his hobbies were, he was stumped. He had always worked. He had no hobbies. Daddy worked many years at the rodeo. When the church was responsible for the local rodeo, Daddy always took care of the concession stands. He kept them supplied, had children who worked in them, and provided whatever assistance they needed. When Brian was seven or eight, he got to help his grandpa get the soda and or ice cream to the rodeo. They were going to start very early in the morning, so they camped out in the back of grandpa's pickup so they would not wake everyone up when they left in the morning. They left before the sun was up and got to the warehouse before first light. He remembers that they switched vehicles and drove a refrigerated truck to the fairgrounds. Daddy loved to pray. Whenever a prayer was needed in a church meeting or giving a blessing to a sick person or praying in, in the home, Daddy was willing to step in. When Elaine became a member of the family, she recalls loving to hear him pray. His prayers were so humble and sincere. Daddy enjoyed serving as the financial ward clerk. A niece, Nancy, wrote that her fondest memory of Uncle Larry was going to pay her tithing as a child. She always, he always made her feel that her memory was, that her money was important even though sometimes it was a few pennies, he accepted it graciously and typed out a receipt. Daddy loved to work in the church ranch. Daddy often gathered several of Susan's children to help him move the cattle, build and check fences, brand calves, and other jobs needed on the church ranch. When it was time for lunch, they appreciated being treated as an adult. Because they worked as such, they were given positions in the front of the line ahead of those who had not helped. They have many stories telling of long days, scary moments, but all the time they were working with their grandpa and enjoying being with him. Once, he took a four-year-old with him and was able to keep him, get him to stay on a horse all day to help him move cattle. One of Daniel's favorite memories of grandpa was working all day putting in fence posts for a gate up on the church ranch. It was hard, but fun work, and at the end of the day, Grandpa said that the gate would last longer than he would. Brian said that Grandpa always talked about riding horses with his cousins. 
He had always been jealous of the time they got to hang out with Grandpa. Daddy appreciated being asked to share his priesthood. Many of his sons and sons-in-laws were ordained under his hands from deacon up to the office of a high priest. In 2018, he made a trip to Idaho to ordain a great-grandson, Isaac, to the office of a deacon. The ward clerk asked Grandpa for his birth date and then had to ask for his membership number because the computer system didn't go back more than 100 years. <laughs> And Daddy loved the temple. My earliest memory was at an age at age three. Karen and I went with our parents to be sealed in the Mesa Temple. They left us in the car and warned us not to get out, as we were dressed in our white dresses and new white shoes. We were we were told we wouldn't be able to wear our shoes if we got out of the car. Of course, they took so long that we had just gotten out of the car when they came to get us. He loved serving in the temple and seeing so many friends and relatives there. He worked in the temple 20 years. He had to quit when Mama's health challenges required him to stay with her at all times. One of the hardest days in his life was the day he had to tell his co-workers goodbye. In closing, I want to read a poem written by Ryland McMahon, a grandson. Patience, love, and stubbornness. A lifetime of caring and sharing his gifts. A cowboy, farmer, father, and friend. Memories he made have no end. A well-earned reunion, hearts with delight. An example of our Lord, our Savior, who shared his light. We are proud of the man you fought to become, who will not stop working till all is done. Until the time comes when we meet again, with all our love, our Father, our friend.
the name of that group is Miss, uh, it's not right, because I didn't, it has my name, but and I'm sure proud of them, but I wouldn't call it the Conrad Frost family, seniors. Um, time to prepare and then <clears throat> but um, and I'm not glad that uh, that uh, this opportunity has finally come but I'm I'm sure glad for dad that uh, that he lived a good life, and he, for the most part, went out on his terms. <clears throat> this morning I'd like to share a message about hope and love, our hope to return to the presence of our Father in Heaven, and his love for us makes it, for us makes it possible. Our life's journey on earth began with our first breath, the day we were born. Our birth is celebrated, and our birth date is used for identification purposes throughout our lives. Anniversaries of our birth, of our birthday, are anticipated for the added experiences that come with age. We start our schooling, or we're baptized, advancing classes in school and church, and qualify for a driver's license, and to serve a mission. It's usually found on our headstone, followed by a dash mark that separates from the date of our death. Some have dash marks representing a long life, like my father, but for some it represents only days, hours, or minutes. The dates on our headstones do not represent our beginning or our end. We live before our entrance into this mortal life and exist after our exit. Before our birth into mortality, we lived with our Heavenly Parents. It was a wonderful ex existence where we were given the choice to follow Christ or Satan. Christ's plan is for us to, to leave the presence of God, come to earth to receive a body, learn to obey the commandments, and repent of our sins to be worthy to return to live with God again. Christ would come and atone for our sins to make, that, to make repentance possible. The plan Satan offered was for us to come to earth with no opportunity for us to choose good or evil. We made the decision to follow the plan presented by Jesus. I'm grateful for the, Jesus, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which teaches that we are all children of a loving Father in heaven, who has provided the way for us to be with him if we choose. We lived as a family with our heavenly parents. As his children, we wanted to have the life that he has he taught Moses, Behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the mortality and eternal life of man. Christ's atonement and resurrection makes these blessings possible. Our obedience to the laws and ordinances will qualify us for, to receive both the immortality and our eternal life. In 2 Nephi we read, O oh, how great the holiness of our God! For he knoweth all things, and there is nothing save he knows it. And he cometh into the world that he may save all men, if they will hearken unto his voice. For behold, he suffereth the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children, who belong to the family of Adam. He suffereth this, that the resurrection might pass upon all men, that all might stand before him at the great and judgment day. And he commandeth all men that they must repent and be baptized in his name, having a perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel, or they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. In the General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in um, October of 20, uh, 2019, 
Helder Ubdorf equated our life here on earth to the adventure of the hobbit, Bilbo Baggins. Hobbits do not seek adventure, in quoting Helder Ubdorf. It's, however, when Bilbo was presented with the prospect of a grand adventure, something stirred deep within his heart. He, underst he understands from the onset that the journey will be challenging, even dangerous. There is even a possibility that he might not return, and yet the call to adventure has reached deep into his heart, and so this unremarkable hobbit leaves comfort behind and enters the path to a great adventure that will take him all the way to there and back." End quote. What awaits us when we make it back again? What an incredible reunion Dad must have had with Mom. His son, his parents, his brothers and sisters, and the many relatives and friends he has had through the many years. I don't know of anyone that Dad would not want to see because of anything that Dad had done to injure them. We are taught that our ancestors who have passed through the veil into the spirit world are teaching the gospel of those who did not receive it during their life on earth. In Doctrine and Covenants we read, But behold, from among the righteous he organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commanded them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even unto all the spirits of men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead. And the chosen messengers went forth to de declare the acceptable day of the Lord and proclaim liberty to the captives who were bound, even unto all who would repent of their sins and receive the gospel. Thus was the gospel preached to those who had died in their sins without a knowledge of the truth or in transgression, having rejected the prophets. These were taught faith in God, repentance from sin, vicarious baptism for the remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, and all other principles of the gospel that were necessary for them to know in order to qualify themselves for that, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh and live according to God in the gift in the spirit. And dead and the dead who repent will be redeemed through obedience to the ordinances of the law of the house of God. There's work being done on the other side to help prepare for the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And God uses those willing to do it. Dad really enjoyed raising a garden, mending fences and moving cattle. It was his life's desire. Fixing heavy equipment and driving trucks fit his family and gave Dad tried to make a living farming, and he went to fixing trucks. He, but he loved, he loved to farm. He'd go and help Jr. Um, probably pastor Jr. to let him come and help uh, plow or disc or work on the farm or anybody's farm. But. Um, that fixing equipment and driving trucks fed his family and gave him many interesting stories to tell and to retell. I'm sure the skills he learned as a, as a father, as a brother, as a ministering brother, missionary in Sydney, Australia, bishop's counselor, Aaronic priesthood teacher, ward clerk, and temple worker will help him in his new assignments. He is not far away, his mom beside him again. I know that life has a purpose, and I am confident in, in what Dad did with his life, that he, he emulated the, the teachings of our Savior, the example that the Savior gave us to love one another and to help and be a friend, and uh, I'm where uh, wherever I've gone in my life and met people that knew 
Harry Frost. I was always very proud to be associated with him. Um, I, I know that that uh, Dad had a testimony of, of the Savior, and uh, I would like to share these words and testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. for the opportunity that I've had to be here today. It's been amazing to me to have the history of our country here before us and to hear the things that um, Larry did and the places that he went, the things that he experienced through a lifetime, and the amazing life. And as I sat here today and listened to these words and looked into your faces of all the amazing things that happened, the most amazing is right here. Um, you are blessed to have had this man as your patriarch and your guide. Um, what a, a great, great man and a great tribute that has been paid here today. Life goes by in a flash, doesn't it? Even 104 years, it goes by in a flash. Before we know it, brothers and sisters, we will all be back with our heavenly parents reunited with families and spouses and children and brothers and sisters. I am grateful for that knowledge. I'm grateful for the plan of salvation that our Father in heaven has for each of us. I believe that this meeting is complete. I would just leave you with my testimony that I know that our Father lives that he is aware of us, that he knows us, that he sent his only begotten son in the flesh to come and to prepare a way that we might return to him, that he died for our sins and that on the third day he was resurrected. And through that resurrection that we shall again see him in the flesh. Praise be the name to the name of Jesus Christ our Savior. And in his name, we close this meeting, even in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will close by singing hymn number 112, Our Savior's Love, after which our, the closing prayer will be offered by Alana Bayless.
Father in heaven, we thank thee for all that thou hast given us, especially Daddy, and the example that he gave us. We pray that we may follow them. Bless the ones that are ill and are mourning, and that we will all return to our homes in safety. We say this name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What's that? <laughs> Did you ever think you'd live this long, Gramps? No. Forty years ago, I thought if I got a license for five years, that's the last one I'll need. <laughs> and I got one, five more. That's sure the last one. Then I got another. <laughs> then I got cops got me, and they, they wouldn't let me get another one. <laughs> that was five years ago. <laughs> Isn't that the end of that?